Let be at home. Bob turns up licking like he'd been sleeping in the nearest park bench overnight. Unshaven, hair standing on end, looking for trouble. And Bob, before anyone could get to him to ask him why he was there, strode across the hall and I was with him and I said, Mrs. Thatcher, there's someone I think you'd like to meet, Bob Geldof. And she said, ah. And she said, how do you do, you know, and all this sort of thing. And I, and I said, I mean, at the moment, you've got a problem with the uh, butter mount and you don't know how to dispose of it. To sell to the Russians is the cheapest way. I'm sorry, but butter doesn't do very much good in Africa. Well, 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 butter oil actually does. It is one of the major butter supplementary oil, foods. If you can, if you can get it. Uh, but it is a byproduct of butter. Yes. I was pressed up very close to her, so she's quite small and I'm relatively tall, so I was looking down and she's sort of had to go like this. A lot is going, a lot of surface food is going, but don't the forget... Minister, there are millions dying, and yeah. that's the terrible thing. Difficult to tell who was lecturing who. Geldof became the people's champion. Suddenly I was this figure. Uh, which sort of hadn't sunk in really yet, and it was seen as a big confrontation with the Prime Minister. One of these great moments when Maggie, the great, wonderful Maggie Thatcher, was brought down to that size, because she was wrong. That's what he did so brilliantly. He just stood up and said, this is wrong. And still today, it's like, you know, moments t cab drivers remember. Ah, I'll remember that time you told them, fuck it, they had to fuck off. Good me, I'll fuck it, remember that. Well, I didn't. At a time of great political change, the punk and the prime minister had more in common than anyone realised. She lashed out with her handbag at every institution she saw, the monarchy, the old Tory party, the old Labour party, the trade unions. She was a punk. Back then, it wasn't exactly cool to support Mrs Thatcher. Highest standard of living ever. Highest output. Highest investment. Highest retail sales. Highest ownership of houses. Please, will you remember that sometime? But secretly, many, like Geldof, admired her policies. Privatised industries ignited the share-buying dream. Council house tenants bought up their own homes. And in the city, young guns were making a killing. There was a great deal of prosperity about, and we were seeing the beginnings, perhaps, of, uh, was it Cortina Man um, in those days? A lot more people in this country felt that they were budding capitalists. Guess what? We bought our council house. You know, paid rent for 350,000 years. We're, we're homeowners. We actually can do it now. We're share, share, we've got shares. We were all being told that to go out and make money, you know, if you're an 18-year-old kid, just make money. That's it. It's cool to be 18 and have a Porsche and wear, you know, red braces and, uh, and, and have these new mobile phones which were the size of a backpack and stuff. That's cool, you know. I actually think it is cool. Geldof had become a charity entrepreneur and Mrs Thatcher loved entrepreneurs. I think what they were doing was almost a sort of privatisation of aid. It was very much a return to a, a sort of 19th century idea of, of philanthropy and of people um, spontaneously taking an initiative to help other people rather than relying on or expecting um, the state to do it for them. We are the world. Even in the home of capitalism, the cream of America's music talent was jumping on Geldof's bandwagon. 45 top stars were about to record their own charity single for the family. I was quite moved at the fact that um, a bunch of Brits got together, you know, and decided to do this. I think that's what really kind of woke us all up in America. There comes a time. The two superstars of the moment, Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, wrote the song and Richie's manager, Ken Cragen, invited Geldof to come to Los Angeles for the recording. 
Well, I'd never spoken to Bob Geldof uh, before. I uh, didn't really know what I was in for. At the Band Aid recording in London, the talent had gone to the local chippy for their dinner. But in California, they did things differently. I got, I don't know, $50,000 worth of free food donated for the group and for then it was all spread out. It was in Hollywood, California. So when you say, would any restaurant like to cater for free? Well, it's only gonna be Spago's, it's only gonna be Chasen's, and their presentation is going to be over the top. Geldof was not impressed. The only problem with that is Bob walked in, saw it, and started berating the people for eating while, they, while the people were dying in Africa. It was a little egregious, like, you know, I think the, the caviar, the lavishness of it. it. It was a little embarrassing. I had to go retrieve Bob and get him back to the studio. We Are the World raised $45 million across the globe, four times as much as Band-Aid. They'll always say to you, oh, you're the guy who did uh, We Are the World, and I go, no, you know. But, you know, whenever I walk into a bloody room in Africa, we are the world, <laughs> no, wrong song. The money-making potential of a huge gathering of top-class talent would stay with Geldof. Two months before, he'd been written off as a fading star, hell-bent on his own publicity. Now, he was the man on a mission, the conscience of the nation. They started to call him Saint Bob. He slipped from, you know, you know, the rock star persona into the Saint Bob persona um, very easily. They stopped calling him um, I'm a musician or a, a singer. They always referred to him regarding his charity work rather than his musical work, and that was kind of sad because we, I mean, we were still a band, we were still a working band. People would come up and, "Hello, Bob, how are you? How's it going? Is everyone okay over there now? How's it all going?" and would thrust money at him, and rings and everything. I wanted this to stop now. I mean, it was already beyond any control I had. So, ladies and gentlemen, for tonight's special award, Bob Geldof and Midjur, please come forward. But Geldof was the face and the voice of Band-Aid, and the story everyone wanted. And his unique force of character came at a cost to those close to him. He was awful in, in these award ceremonies. He would literally just go and get the award, say, thanks so much, don't know where I'd be without you, you know, you've saved people, thanks so much, bye. Leaving Mitch with no award and nothing, to just stand there going, you know, you know. And Mitch, you're... We both went up to pick up the award, and Bob, in his usual manner, launched into this huge speech. I'll say something leaving me standing behind them again, um, you know, three feet behind them, looking a bit kind of dazed and confused. Why wouldn't he want Midge to share the awards and the glory and the credit for doing what they did? Why does the rest of the world think it's just Bob's baby? Why did Bob allow that to happen? It was a classic guild of, you know, it doesn't mean it, it's just that he's there and he was launching at this big thing about about the whole Band-Aid Live Aid thing and, and, and whatever, but um, it's just how he is. He had the awards and he had the acclaim, but old suspicions began to resurface. Some reporters were openly hostile. Fortuitously, but not by design, the success of Geldorf and Band-Aid has brought new life to the sagging popularity of the Boomtown Rats. It has earned the group criticism that they're cashing in on Geldorf's Ethiopian philanthropy, even that his obsession with fundraising has become sanctimonious. The thing is that if they say, oh, what a publicity stunt, I mean, it is, it is frankly ridiculous. I don't work 20 hours a day on publicity stunts. Tonight, the Rats will hold a concert in London and can reflect that while they never planned it, the ill wind from Africa has certainly done them some good. But had it, 
The rest of the rats certainly didn't think so. Suddenly on this tour, 80-year-old ladies were coming up and says, Hiya, Bob, here's 20 pounds. It was good, but it was strange, you know. We were trying to be a rock and roll band, you know. <laughs> but we don't want your mum to like this. That tour was wildly different because the old buckets would have gone around um, or they were at, at the exit. So, like, you know, we'd come in and every, everyone's job... I mean, so I promise you, in the band, we'd have to divvy up the buckets and count the money. The Band Aid buckets raised £50,000, much more than the band was making on its record sales. We would leave the venue, get on the tour bus, all the buckets would be piled onto the tour bus and they'd be down the centre aisle. And rather than the usual sort of rock and roll like Jack Daniels and telling wild stories, we'd all be there counting. That's another five, that hundred pounds. You, you count the coins. You can, and the whole band would be sitting there till about two o'clock in the morning um, counting all the, the, uh, this money. And this would happen every night. Pathetic, you know. Where were the babes, you know? Why didn't they count them, you know? Didn't happen. I was a Boomtown Rats fan. Yeah, I really, really liked them as a band. And in fact, I saw the Boomtown Rats at university and was annoyed <laughs> at how many thousands of people wanted to get in to see them, because I had been a fan. But of course, people were there to worship at the shrine of St. Bob, and rightly so, rightly so, he'd done such an incredible thing. But I was annoyed, because I'd been there at the beginning. It was the end of the road for the Rats, and Geldof bowed to the inevitable. Since his visit there, Ethiopia had never been far from his thoughts. Now he had a brainwave. Bob came in one day and said, look, we have to break this trucking cartel, but we haven't got enough money. And we all kind of went, oh, OK. He said, I've got this idea. We were going to do a concert. Now, Bob, in his way, this wasn't a consultation with the trustees. This was a statement of fact. This was going to happen. And I think we were all were scared. We all sat there kind of going, huh? But Geldof couldn't do it alone. He needed someone as bolshy as himself to get the job done. Harvey Goldsmith was the biggest promoter of the day. What's more, this tough music industry bruiser had the mouth to match Geldof's own. I actually basically told him to fuck off at first because I just thought he was being ridiculous. I mean, he actually did say, you're fucking mad. But Geldof wouldn't take no for an answer. The phone rang, and there he was, saying, got to see you today, got to get this concert together. And I said, I'm just unpacking, I've just got off the plane from China, I don't know where I am, um, let's talk tomorrow. Got in the office, I think I've been there about six minutes, phone rang, Bob again. I said, OK, let's meet. do a big concert at Wembley, lots of big acts, and rattled off the A to Z of, of uh, that time, um, every major act there was, and said they're all doing it. And I just looked at him and said, yeah, very funny. And he says, what do you mean, one concert, two continents? What, why do you do that? Basically, everything he said he wanted to do, I said, you can't. So we went, that was our starting point. It's a nightmare you're going to have in the middle of the summer. But they're already booked up. But like he kept saying, and then what's going to? What are you going to do then? And then what? And he, you could see he kept asking a question. In the back of my mind, um, I actually knew it was possible, but I didn't want to tell him that. <laughs> We're scared of Bob. We're scared of Gelda. Now he just needed the talent, and for them. There was no safe hiding place. And he just approached me at the, at, in the middle of Heathrow Airport. I don't think he was going anywhere. I think he was just sort of there haranguing people. Scared the crap out of me, so I said yes. And he was so angry and committed and, and very you know, volatile. And um, so I just went along with it. You know, you don't say no to Bob or girl off very easily. We're scared of Bob. What did you say to Bob? No. <laughs> Do you know anyone that said no to Bob? You don't say no to Bob. Um, and um, I thought it was such a great idea that, of course, I said yes immediately. 